Netflix had it too. But Psych was also one of those ones that it almost seemed like my part-time job to audition for it. <laughs> but never actually get it. But I always get like, that was great, that was great. See you again next week, right? <laughs> and then so I spent uh, 2012 immigrating down here to the United States, which meant I couldn't leave here and I also couldn't work for most of the year. So I was just sort of like, can I, can you please just do anything? And then I finally got my sort of travel work permit, went back to Vancouver to go deal with some stuff there, like some businessy things and more like immigration-y stuff, and managed on the second to last day I was there, get an audition for Psych again. I was like, oh, okay, this is fun. I'm truly back home. Gonna go audition and probably not get it. And then, it ended up being the first job I got after I got my ability to work in the United States, and of course it's back up in Canada. <laughs> um, but no, that was like, it was a really great set to be on for me. Um, one reason, the camera crew was the same guys who did, I don't know if any of you saw it, but I did a, uh, one of those sci-fi disaster movies called End of the World. And the psych camera crew ended up replacing the first guys who were on camera on the first day. And we like kind of really clicked and we figured out how to work with each other really easily. So that was nice, number one. Number two, the psych cast are just really cool people. Um, James and, uh, uh, oh man, I'm just forgetting names Dulé. of all. Dulé, yeah. James and Dulé are like constantly bantering off each other, even off camera. They're sort of like, they're kind of those characters in real life a little bit. But also, the attention to detail, like James, I don't know if a lot of you know this, James Roday writes a whole bunch of the episodes, directs a bunch of them, is producer and stars in them, like, in almost every scene. So he's sort of like, just living psych, and I think that's kind of a really cool thing to see how successful the show's been and how long it's been going on. I mean, it's, I think it's really cool when an actor can get really involved in what he's doing rather than just sort of sit back and be like, all right, I got a paycheck, this is great, I don't really care about the show anymore, but he actually like, really gets in there. And, uh, we, he, we changed a bunch of the dialogue on the day when we were filming just to make it funnier or like quicker or anything, which is how I love to work. Um, and also, uh, Kirsten Nelson and, and uh, Tim are like great people. I didn't really have scenes with them, but we, yeah, just hit it off really well. I keep on seeing her in random places. Like I was at a Peter Gabriel concert randomly because <laughs> my friend had tickets randomly and was like, you want to come? I was like, okay, I, I, all right. And then she was sitting right by us. Dave only turned out to be behind us. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what's going on anymore. Um, yeah, that was Psych. Psych was super fun. Uh, it's. So, so I know a lot of people probably identify you with the character Fargo. Who would you say is like the character you played is like the exact opposite of Fargo? Fargo's the way he's in the you ever played. The exact opposite of Fargo? Um, well, the, the very first role I did that I was actually paid for that had a name <laughs> was uh, a character named William Collette on a, a Canadian show called Da Vinci's Inquest, mm. which, yeah, it played, I think, yeah, it played this indication. For those of you who don't know, it's uh, a detective show, basically, um, about this guy, Da Vinci, who's a corner of Vancouver, it's based off of a real guy who later became the mayor of Vancouver. It's sort of ripped from the headlines, stories, and my character, uh, slightly different than Fargo, um, was a baby raping killer. <laughs> I, I didn't really know how to sugarcoat that one at all. <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's probably about as far from Fargo as you can get. I 
Um, it was, uh, wait, I don't even remember acting like the tyrant in the episodes. What was the Did question? What was the, what was the question? Yeah, I think, I don't know, it was just really fun to like be able to go in and, and have to, yeah, pretend that I'm slightly powerful, but still normal Fargo, who's like got no self-confidence most of the time. Who's having to try to be this weird, confident mean leader? I don't know. It just it was a, a nice. I think what it did was it made Fargo into a human who had sort of more emotions at stake rather than just a plot device, which I thought was definitely what Fargo was becoming around season three-ish, where it was sort of like, like I personally thought that he was getting in. For example, there's the episode where they're trying to uh, make the uh, the giant catcher's mitt, they're going to call it, science catcher. And they just need this one piece to go in, otherwise it's going to blow up and the entire town is going to be destroyed and probably everything, everyone's going to be dead. Now, for some reason in this episode, and this is where I was like, please don't make me do this. Like, now you're just turning me into not, not a super villain just a super stupid villain <laughs> where I had like one, the, the item that they needed to put in it was Fargo's and he didn't want to give it away because it was his. It's like, so at what point do you just become completely criminally negligent <laughs> when at stake is your like $50 trinkety thingamadog or the lives of thousands of people Potentially tens of thousands of people if this thing blows up and creates a nuclear type explosion. So uh, that was the thing where Fargo started getting into that territory, or it just got into way too much like, I wonder what happens if I push this button. Oops! And now Fargo! Whoa! <laughs> like, I mean, my, my biggest fear was Fargo becoming Far Far Binks, basically. <laughs> And I was definitely veering into that territory, so doing this time switch up and everything got it back into a more grounded human being, and then with the addition of Holly, Felicia Day's character, and all of that loss and everything, there was a lot more just humanity in him afterwards and after the switch. Uh, yes. Favorite author? Oh, man. I mean, my wife is the reader of, of the two of us. She can just devour books, and then she kind of tells me what to read, and hopefully I get through them. Um, I mean, I couldn't say I have a specific favorite one that I can think of right now. And I know it's a really easy answer to say, but the last series of books I read all the way through, almost to the point of I read them too fast and need to reread them because I realized I think I skimmed over too much stuff because I was like, where's the next chapter? Um, was Game of Thrones. I mean, I, I, started, I started reading, I think, the first book near the end of season four of Eureka. And when we got off, or when we were finished filming, I basically didn't leave my couch and pile of blankets that I had. And I sort of sat there. Oh, I think I had an email. I was going to pretend I was leaving through, but no. It's the digital age. I was pressing a button. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was the last set that I fully read through that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, um, well the first one was probably Joe Morton on Eureka, uh, Terminator 2 was the first R-rated movie I saw in a theater, so, and it just, for some reason, like, I always, I mean, it's one of my favorite movies, and then, so, when I got in there, and I was like, oh my god, it's Miles Dyson, what do I do, what do I do, and I was just sort of like, I don't think I talked to him the entire first season, because I was just sort of like... <laughs> I think I just basically did that, and then finally, 
I was like, wait, what am I doing? I work with this guy. Like, I'm just now being that really weird guy. <laughs> like, you know, I think like a couple times we were just sitting at Crafty and, and I was just watching him eat. Crafty is like our snack table. And I think I was just like piling up a cracker with some cheese and probably because I was just watching him, I was probably really piling it with a lot of cheese. <laughs> That's too much cheese, Mr. Morton. <laughs> Continue eating your bagel. <laughs> uh, that's, what, that's what I can think of. Um, well, one of my favorites is uh, Christmas Animated. Yeah, that one was, that was so different to do than any of the other episodes. Mostly because it was animated. Um, but what we did with that one, which I don't know if they even do this in normal animated shows, was they had a room set up about uh, like, like this, and then they had cameras for each one of us all around, and then a little, like a podium type thing by it with our lines. But they recorded just like our faces and our mannerisms while we were saying all the, while we were doing all of the lines. And we were doing it all together like it was, you know, a live read through of it or something like that. Um, also, a lot of the, uh, the other voices on that, like the, uh, for example, there's a point where there's a bunch of talking buttons that are talking to Fargo saying, like, push me, push me, things like that. It's just us doing that, we just sort of, whenever there is an opportunity to have another voice in there, we just all sort of jumped in and did that. Um, yeah, that one was, uh, I believe we also, um, because, okay, uh, fake snow in movies can be a very, or in TV, can be really tricky. Either you have, like, real ice, which is kind of hard to get, or like real snow, or it's this weird concoction of potato stuff. It's like potato powder and water that shoots out of a fan. It's something I don't really understand how it works. It's really weird. But then it turns into this super weird glue if you don't clean it off right away, which we learned <laughs> the previous episode, uh, the previous Christmas episode, where a lot of clothing and shoes were ruined. So this year, I don't know how they did it, but during the winter time, uh, one of the producers had the idea to rent a few semi-trucks and fill them with snow and park them in a really cold place somewhere. I don't know where, but we had actual snow because we filmed it in the middle of August. That was the other thing. We, every time we've done a Christmas episode, it's like it's always in the hottest month and we're always sort of like, that's why they made it or one of the, the previous one, I think, they made it like, oh, it's so hot, because there's something, it's, cause it's really hot outside, it's August, and we're filming it. Um, so yes, we had a bunch of semi-trucks of snow that we dumped out in the middle of uh, <laughs> August. And where we filmed for the, the little small town area, it's a place called Chilliwack. Um, for whatever reason, it has quite a high incidence of, um, mentally ill people who don't necessarily have homes or are sort of uh, transient, like, they just sort of will wander by sometimes and get kind of confused as to what's going on. So this time there was, it was the middle of August and there was a bunch of snow. And I mean, I'm not, I'm honestly not making fun of people or anything, but it was at certain points really, strange to see people come by and go like, it's snowing, hallelujah! And while we were doing takes, people would be yelling this in the background, and we're like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, any, uh, any other ones? Or is, I think they're waiting. Oh. You know what? Um, we didn't really have time to do pranks. We get that, we get asked that a lot. It seems like we would be pranking each other, but I think the biggest prank-like situation was actually just me and Colin being really stupid. Um, we decided it was a really good idea to have a flashlight war. Um, I'll explain to you what, this brilliant idea from these two men of science in the moment. Um, so we had these flashlights that were about this big, 
they were really powerful. And you had like, you click them on the button on the back. And then our brilliant idea was to go, this is me, you guys are Colin. Hey Colin, click right in the eyeball. <laughs> and then he would be like, oh! And he'll, what, click? And I'd be like, oh, you got me! Oh, that's really bright. Like, yeah, it is. Click, oh! And we did that for about a day and a half. <laughs> and then we're sort of like, you know, whenever I blink, it's orange inside, and when I open up my eyes, everything looks purple. <laughs> I don't think what we're doing is a good idea. And Colin is like, I agree, I agree. I don't think I can see as well in the night as I used to. <laughs> I used to see very well in the night, and it's only been a day. You know what, Neil? I think we should have a truce. Yeah, okay, truce, truce. And then Colin would go, I'm really glad we're, ha! <laughs> and then it would continue again for a little bit. But we finally did stop that, and I'm quite sure, I mean, I was already blind before, but I'm pretty sure that didn't really help me. <laughs> um, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> that was a funny one. Usually, characters that I play don't often have romances, or they're really awkward most of the time. And then I found myself, at this point, to be playing, basically doing two romances, because I had Fargo and Holly, and then, of course, Andy and Sarah, which was the funnest, it was super fun, because I just sort of, the way I do Sarah stuff is I would go in uh, when we were doing ADR, which is automatic dialogue replacement, so if ever there's a weird sound on a take, you just re-record the line. But so I'd go in for that, and then I'd just do all my Sarah stuff at the same time, where I would just say the lines three times, give them the choice of what one they want to use, and then do it, and then I'd almost forget that there was this whole arc with Andy and Sarah going in, so I get to see the whole thing as I was going in and be like, oh, that's so sweet. And kind of weird, because Kevin's my buddy. And I've known him for a long time. I know his wife and his several kids. You know, I don't know. It was really neat and fun, though. I thought it was really sweet. Okay, five minutes left. Yes? Okay, so there was an episode where Jack jumped into a whole bunch of people. Can you do your Jack? Ooh, ooh. Ooh. I will explain how we did that before, and then I'll try to do something. Okay. Um, what me and Colin did for that one was we actually just took the script and did the scene as ourselves, and then, I mean, get it backwards in my brain trying to figure it out. But when Sheriff Carter's body has Fargo inside it, that was a weird phrase. <laughs> um, uh, so in the script it would say Carter, but then in brackets Fargo. So I would go and I would do all those lines, and vice versa. He would do the Carter lines, and we'd sort of play it off each other like that, and then try to imitate each other as best as we could. Um, the only line I really remember, and oh, I know they got a really good take for it, but... Uh, something along the lines of, um, uh, does this look like my face? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, this is not my face at all! Something like that. I can't really do it so much now. But, but that is my favorite, one of my favorite compliments I ever got. Sideways, I guess, because it wasn't directed at me. Um, one of the executives went up to Colin and said, like, oh, you know what one of my favorite lines was? The, the, this is not my face at all. Line. That was great. And Colin was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Great, <laughs> thanks." And I was kind of right there, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "But yeah, so sorry I couldn't have done it for you better this time." <laughs> um, any other? Yes. What is on my DVR right now? Well, I've got a whole mess of True Blood waiting to be watched. 
Um, that's one of my wife's favorites, and she kind of got me hooked on it. I didn't think I would for some reason, but I, it's so campy and deliciously campy that I quite enjoy it. Um, I have a weird thing for true crime stuff. I don't know why, I just really enjoy the like really cheesy narration and the way they lead into a story about an innocent girl in San Francisco. And then something bad happens, right? It's like, you know, they own a baking company in Salt Lake City. Little do they know, it was a recipe for murder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of that. I'm trying to think of what the, the, the newer shows that are on. I just started watching Orange is the New Black, yes. which I find amazing. Um, but yeah, that's sort of that's what I've been checking out so far. I've been doing so much traveling in the last month or so that I've been more, uh, I'm trying to find the most local specific programming I can find and just to see what it's like. It's not so in the United States, it's not that crazy, but I was in Australia. That was, some of it was really weird. I ended up watching like their version of fitness commercials and things like that. And they're just sort of, I don't know, there's something a little bit more, everything on that continent is trying to kill you. <laughs> this is why you need this fitness program to work for you sort of thing. It's kind of neat. Um, okay, well, uh, I, it is now time for me to go. This is, is the end. Thank you so much.